It's the True Faith Newcastle United podcast, Newcastle humiliated Aston Villa by five goals to one on the opening day of the season at St James's Park. What a day, what a result, what a football club. I'm Alex, I'm joined by Cy, Charlotte and Sam Dalling this week to talk about what happened and why. Charlotte, what a day, how was it for you? Uh, unbelievable. I got there really early, we were just talking before we started recording about, um, about how uh the ticketing was you know it was digital ticketing it was the first big premier league game that we did digital ticketing for so i was a bit nervous so i got there quite early and watched the kind of build up watched the team um warm up and i was just getting more and more excited as the as the ground filled up um war flags are back there was a big 1892 display in the east stand couldn't see it properly but i've seen pictures and it looked really great and of course the pyrotechnics which were a, a really great <laughs> thing to get really g us up um but yeah, it was just amazing. It was so loud in the corner yesterday. It was like nonstop. It was amazing. Um, Tonali songs, Gordon songs, just everybody was so happy to be back. And then on top of that, it was one of the best performances I've seen, certainly on an opening day, um, if not in ages at St. James's Park. So um, yeah, it was just incredible. Really great to be there. Yeah, on the noise. I was in the East End and often I've, I've sat in various places in the ground over the years and the acoustics don't always work. Some t- I, you know, I speak to some people after the game who say actually all I could hear was the away fans and I've had that before when I'm down the other end of the East End, but the safe standing really has made a massive difference. I thought the atmosphere was actually one of the best there's been at St. James's Park since the takeover. I mean, it helps when you score in every 15, 20 minutes, <laughs> doesn't it? Like <laughs> there's a, that's the kind of common denominator in terms of an atmosphere, but there was no sense of ring rustiness. And I was worried about that game. I'm a bit, I'm still, I've talked about my old school mentality. I've, I've kind of still been oh, a bit anxious. Oh, Newcastle really that good. And I thought Villa were good. And like, they're making no bones of trying to do what we did last year. They want to be the side that disrupts. I mean, if you look at their upward trajectory from when Unai Emery came in, like, I thought they were a real, real worry and they're a potential rival. And we just like blew them away. I know we'll get into the details, but what are we, 12 or 15 hours later, I still can't really believe it's happened. It feels a bit odd. Yeah, I, I mean, um, firstly on the ticketing, I missed the first six minutes of the game because of the ticketing. I probably ambitiously left only 20 minutes time to get in the ground and miss the start, but I'm sat here beaming and I enjoyed my day so much that at any other time I'd be really annoyed about that because I missed a goal, but I was still absolutely buzzing because I got to see four and I got to see, as you say, shot probably the, the perfect opening fixture in so, so many ways, which I'm sure we'll get into debut goals, debut performances, Tonali, everything. It was just incredible. And, and yeah, I have not been in an atmosphere like that. I thought I thought this season would be a challenge in terms of atmosphere. I kind of forgot about the safe standing because you're right, that made a big difference. But I thought this season was going to be a challenge in terms of atmosphere because we're, we're now expected to win. But that wasn't a, a group of fans expecting Newcastle to win. That was a group of fans saying, how are <laughs> it's, It was just fucking mint. It was class. First goal audio is up there. Like, go back, listen to it, as I'm sure you will have 150 times already. Mm. But listen to that noise, that roar for Tonali's goal. It's, yeah, scoring any goal is beautiful and nice. But that first one, the roar is kind of special. Yeah. It's, a, it's a little bit, um, you know, Wilson post takeover. Mm. Um, goal is probably the only one I can think of where, like, the noise is yeah. just, and, and what I absolutely love because I'm a petty, vindictive man. <laughs> I love how that would have sounded from the away end. <laughs> it must have been like, for fuck's sake. And even though they got back into the game very briefly, um, seeing that Villa away end, got, it was gone, it was done it was when, when Wilson, was it Wilson? No, sorry, not Wilson. Barnes got the fifth. You looked up to give him a customary two fingered salute, and they were gone. There's no one to swear at. They'd been they'd been gone for about twenty minutes at that point. Honestly, what, what is it about away fans at St James's Park pissing off? Here? Like we don't do. We were shit for a long time. I was at Villa Park. Yeah, we didn't get beat five one, but we lost two nil under Bruce. I was there. We, like everyone was annoyed. We stayed till the end. But mm. enough about them. What 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 a day! It, it just everything was perfect. Yeah, it was it wasn't perfect sunshine, but it was warm. Maybe too warm. Um, <laughs> humid, that's warm. The, that's but the flames for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, town absolutely bouncing mm. pre-game, post-game, the ground bouncing. You know, sometimes you get games when you're so far ahead of the opposition that the atmosphere kind of dies a bit. Loads of people leave early. It wasn't like that yesterday. Yeah. The atmosphere just built and built and built towards the end of the game. Um, I think the fifth goes in and on 88 maybe, and just from 88 to full time, it was just one of, like like you said, Sam, it was just one of the great atmospheres in James's Park truly privileged to be there yesterday and we're going to talk about lots of things on this show but 
in, in terms of performances, you know, why it happened, what happened, but wow, what a statement win for this side, what a statement win for the Premier League. There were Villa fans yesterday, and lots of them, and particularly in fan media, who didn't just thought they'd give us a game, they thought they'd win. Mm. I kind of I kind of feel like, and it, you know, who gives a fuck essentially what Villa fans think, but I think they bought into <laughs> the media narrative of, of, of some bizarre decline in Newcastle United. Like Newcastle United, and we've talked about a lot on this podcast, are expected in large quarters to decline this season, to get worse, to, to be happy to be in the top seven or to be eighth. Fucking Michael Owen had his ninth, which says a lot about him, not us. <laughs> um, and I think Villa had bought into that. They're the, they're the team that are going to challenge the top four. Newcastle, they're, they're, they're kind of the spurs of last season. Well, they don't think that now, do they? It was just, it was just a win and a performance that signals what Newcastle United will be this season. And it's, it's just an absolute privilege to be here after game one. It's not just fan media, though. It's like mainstream sports media were saying that. Mainstream sports media were saying, this is a really tough start for Newcastle. This is going to be really hard. They're, they're really going to struggle. And, um, and we didn't. It was. I, I don't understand how you can look at, A, last season, B, the season before that, um, or at least like half the season before that, um, and our summer, and conclude that we're, we're, we're going to be lucky to be sort of in the top half of the table this season. That's not what anybody here is talking about. And I'm uh, like a win would have been nice yesterday, uh, like a, a normal two one maybe win. But to, to make a statement like that, to make a five one win to completely dominate the pitch. Yes, they had an injury. Yes, Buendia was already out. Um, doesn't matter like it, 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 um, for all we're being told Emery's making that whole squad stronger they couldn't deal with this yesterday and it's and I'm so pleased that we came out of the blocks in that way yesterday because I think people are starting to sit up already want to ask you all for your favorite thing from yesterday so I start with you mate it's probably the the, the second goal um uh, it, it, set pieces has been a bit of a, a weakness for Newcastle we don't score many goals from them we, we had a few nice little routines last season but across the, 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 the 38 games we did very little but that that little move that and I've, I've, I've watched it back this morning because I was, I was in my head it was Trippy that put the cross in because it's always Trippy that puts the cross in and I didn't realize it was Tonali until I watched the highlights this morning that little knock back the the ball over the outstretched foot and it's just like that is that is progress we have we have been working on on moves and I, I just thought Aston Villa looked shell shocked at, at how we did that so yeah what I love about that goal apart from the obvious things you've talked about is Tyrone Mings did the obvious thing of not giving the ball back to the referee and letting the team go back to the centre circle. It's, like, it's offside, lads. Don't worry about, <laughs> yeah. don't worry about this. We're not even going to get out of like you know formation from effectively a goal kick because this is offside. Don't worry. Like don't panic. As a fan, you're like, oh for fuck's sake, they must they must know something we don't. Turns out that they, they just can't really defend. And their mental high line, including from that set piece, was a joy to behold yesterday. Yeah. Sam, favorite thing? So many. So many. I had a new season ticket and I sat next to this like, older lady and her daughter. And they sit, the way it's worked, I think, over the years is that they have the seats either side of me. Mm. And I turned up and she initially started to give me the spiel. Like, oh, we've been here for 24 years. I'm like, don't worry. I'll just sit wherever you want me to <laughs> sit. You, you just tell me. But I, I think the favourite was that exact goal. The second one, that little dink. Oh, Anything that's mine. like yeah. that. Oh, sorry, Charlotte. It's a, a world-class finish, yeah. that. And it made... Emmy Martinez looks stupid and he does a pretty good job of doing that for himself <laughs> but anything to make him look like a, an idiot and we'll talk about the yellow red card should have been could have been red card thing later but oh that finish I mean it was just and the shoulder his shoulder I tell you what it's waif like to look at but his shoulder has got some serious power I do hope Mings <laughs> is okay but he used his shoulder to good effect yesterday I will add to that very slightly and then I'll pick something else because that was mine for me that was so reminiscent of the West Ham hands on hips just <laughs> watching that ball go in it's just I, the skill involved in, in that angle and that kind of chip into the goal for Isak is it blows my mind I mean for the for his first goal but but that one in particular that's why when we've talked about the most important player this season, he's he's up there. Like he's, There isn't a player who can do stuff like that. Callum Wilson's an excellent centre forward, but he can't, as far as I can see, do those kind of delicate, angular, like chips in in that way. Um, so Sam stole mine, so I'm going to pick maybe just Tonali, maybe just seeing Sandro Tonali's debut. He certainly didn't look unhappy. He, he he looks like he's been, I think you said it on Twitter, Alex, that he looks like he's been playing in this league for about 10 years. 
I'm so excited about what, because that's got to be the beginning, right? Not, this isn't the, the peak. This is the beginning. So I'm very excited about what he can do. More on him, of course, later. Like you say, so many things to choose from yesterday. I absolutely, I think that feeling in that moment, and again, we'll talk about this more later, but Newcastle are 3-1 up. They've maybe dropped off just a little bit. Villa, who seemed to have declared at 3-1 and we made defensive substitutions, um, have come into the game a bit more. They are they're, they're progressing the ball quite nicely. There's that Pope save and the ball goes over the bar. And what do we do? We have Callum Wilson and Harvey Barnes to come on. And just looking at the touchline and seeing those two come on was just like a wow moment. And obviously, yeah. you knew they'd come on. You saw the bench before the game. We had Wilson on the bench last season. But it was just a like, these are fucked in terms of Villa. <laughs> like, like, it's 3-1. You've got to push to, to, to score a goal. I think we all knew Wilson was going to score and we all knew Barnes was going to score. Mm. Um you know, both should have had two. Both yeah, should have had yeah, two, yeah. particularly Wilson. But yeah, um, you know, the predict my prediction of Isak and Wilson getting fifty between them. Well, they're on three after <laughs> one, so I might have to upgrade that prediction to to like one hundred and twenty. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that that that, that just like this, it, forget about what happened, which we'll, we won't forget. We'll talk about, but <laughs> for this, for the purpose of this point, um, just just the the psycho like the psychological impact of of being a Villa defender. And just just being like, oh, for God's sake, lads! Could, like, how long's to go? Like, yeah. how long's left here? What, how how much injury time? Um, yeah, if if we, if everyone said this, if we can keep the core of this squad fit, we're a serious serious side in this division. Because I have no life. When I got home last <laughs> night, I watched Aston Villa's official YouTube channel to get kind of the more honest reaction from Uwe Emery because they always kind of put a brave face on for BBC and Sky, and then you get a little bit more honesty. And he said they definitely didn't deserve to lose 5-1. And for once, for once, I agree with you, right, It should have been 7-8. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's incredibly honest with him. But like, let's let's get into the nitty-gritty, so I'll start with you. Did we deserve it? Do you disagree with Emery? Like, what 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 was, what was do you think the, the gulf in class was between the sides? It's a funny one, isn't it? Because by the end of the game, I was like, you are saying that, sh- that should have been 8 or 9. You know, we missed some really big chances at the end. We said before, Wilson should have scored another... Um, Isaac could have scored a hat-trick and uh, actually Isaac coming off on a hat-trick I thought that was interesting you know uh, making that change and he didn't How look, loves doing that yeah, yeah. he did it loads he did, last he, season he, with he, Wilson he t- as well handled it very professionally um, but yeah of course we deserved it we absolutely blew them out of the way um, I'll, I'll admit throughout the game I was quite nervous and not, nervous is probably the wrong word but there, there was quite a dramatic game it was and, and Aston Villa weren't terrible it was a good game of football but we absolutely prevailed. And the most interesting thing about this kind of new refereeing approach to time-wasting and uh, game management is that everyone thought, oh, is that going to affect us? Because we, we were very good at that kind of shit house we last season. But instead of us wasting loads of time, we've just got an extra 10 minutes at the end of each half to, to, to batter teams into the ground. So I think that's going to benefit us because we are the fittest side. We look so fit, every single player. And there's lads off the bench that we, we are going to punish teams in that stoppage time. We're going to punish teams in the last 10 minutes of halves. Um, and that, that was the most telling thing for me. That's why we deserved to win, because by the end of each half, they looked sh- like done, spent, and we had more to give. And that's that's a really, really encouraging thought. Sam? I think the beauty of this performance was that like, we weren't that good. We were very good, but there's, there's room to get better. And Aston mm. Villa weren't that bad. It wasn't like Tottenham last year, where you're watching and thinking, well, this is a side that have completely given up. They're a shambles. Yeah. They've got no organisation. Like They're dead in the water. Like Aston Villa had their little spells. But what we did, uh, apart from probably their equaliser, and if Cash sticks that one in, that goes over the bar from quite a, quite close in, narrow angle, like it's free too. And then it is going to get a little bit nervous. So, mm. so I think that's the, the main thing I take out of that, is that we were... We were clinical with possession. We were so sharp. Those triangles turning into three, four, five triangles. Gordon coming and giving and going. Like he looks a different player. And they were not talking about individual players, but just the sharpness, the crispness. Of when we had the ball, we used it. There was very little, like very, very little wastage, and we defended by and large really well. But there is still, like Eddie Howe, I think he said it afterwards. There is room to improve, and and that's the brilliant thing. Like with this side, is you go okay. Like it was a good, a very good performance, a very good opening day performance, but it didn't feel like a, right, this is our one in 19 home games where we have a brilliant time. It was like exceptional. Every single thing was brilliant uh, and this won't be repeated. Like that just feels like it's us now. Yeah. And it won't always be that easy, but mm. that is our like level. That's a base level for Newcastle United now. 
Yeah, I think um, I think we I think we did deserve it. I think we deserved to win that by more goals. Um, but what the what Sam and I have said is right. It was very end to end. It was very like Aston Villa, particularly in the first half, looked a bit dangerous on the break after their first goal, which came very quickly after our first goal, mm. after their only goal. Um, you know, you sort of thought, oh, they're, they're kind of back in this game. That that, that are we going to lose our heads? Like, where are we going to go from here? But what I loved to see yesterday was how cool and calm and not bothered by any of that that our players were. It's like, okay, they've got a goal back, so fuck, like, we'll go and get four more. Um, I think um, in terms of having this squad depth now, uh, having subs off the bench that can totally change the game or, or we can just... Um, not change the game, but sort of augment the game is maybe a better word. You, we're not we're not looking to bring off an attacker and and just bring on a defender just to sort of shut up shop. We we can actually go for more goals. We can go for m- more attacking, uh, and and it was it was just a really great thing to see. But to to the point Sam just made, there's so much more to come, and it's so exciting. Exciting is a good word for it, and I, I agree with you both. I think one of the one of the most pleasing aspects of it isn't just the brilliant football, it wasn't just the success of individual performances or even stuff like the the second goal set piece routine, which, by the way, I mean, great finish, great cross, but the skill, like, I know I'm not as good at football at Sven Botman, okay? What? Uh, you know, cards on the table. <laughs> but the skill to be able to get, to stay on side, get ahead of your defender and then make an like an inch perfect pass on the stretch on the half volley. Wow, that yeah. that is like it kind of goes unnoticed, but that is a serious skill at, at, at a football level. Uh, even though kind of the the cross and the finish get the the plaudits, but Newcastle were physically dominant yesterday. It was it was like the power that we have. The discussions about Tonali preseason, uh, about Gordon preseason in particular about. About Isak, some people saying Isak doesn't have Wilson's physicality. Well, yesterday they all they all bullied Aston Villa, and and I agree with you, Sam. Villa and Villa fans probably come away from that game thinking, ropey start, um, terrible last half an hour, but the middle bit was okay, and they might take some solace from that. But I just think physically, like you said, Sai before, as each half wore on, Newcastle United just imposed themselves in a manner that Villa couldn't deal with. And mm. Villa looked very, very well coached, particularly in attack. Mm. There's clearly a lot of training ground patterns going on there. They like their wide players to kind of come in and operate space between the midfield and the defence and play balls around the corner and pop balls off. That's fine. And, the, and they had some success with that yesterday. It was normal way traffic. But as soon as Newcastle United disrupted that, Villa had no answer. And I watched the match with Norman yesterday. And we both kept saying, we we're watching Emery closely on the sideline because we we're just above him in the crowd, above the media bit. He was head in hands a lot of that game when Newcastle United were breaking through Villa's midfield and and Villa Villa's midfield players just there was there was a point um, Costa was chasing Almiron he chased him for four steps and was just like nah this is <laughs> this is this is pointless that happened over and over again and, and the the space that Newcastle United got in behind Aston Villa not just because of Villa's high line but because once Newcastle United players got a, a one or two. Um, yard start on a Villa player they couldn't catch yeah. them you saw that with the uh, the last three goals re- realistically yeah. but also that um, chance Tonali had immediately from the Villa kickoff after the first goal there's no one near him there's no one near Anthony Gordon um, when Martinez makes the save Villa did not have any answers to us and that's the most satisfying thing it's not one of those games where everything you hit goes in and the opposition goalkeeper doesn't make a save, a.k.a. probably Martin Dubravka at Spurs 5-1 a few years ago. Um, it was like, no, Martinez was, was, was arguably one of their better players because he makes three one-on-one saves that if all three had gone in, there's no blame attached to the goalkeeper. Mm-hmm. He makes several other positional saves, which, which are, you know, I'm thinking of the time he messes up and Almiron gets a first-time shot. He pro- probably should score, but it is, he does recover really well. Martinez has pulled off four or five saves there yeah. that on another day all go in and Aston Villa at half time at 60 minutes even when Emery tries to go more defensive nothing works nothing can stop us and it's an incredibly powerful thing and I think the the effect of that last 30 minutes wasn't just the physical um the physical domination Newcastle had but it was Aston Villa mentally disintegrating in front of that crowd in front of that performance and that's why the away end left yeah because it was like these lads are giving us nothing here there's they, they can't 
you know, they can't stem the flow. And that just, it just makes me think Villa are not a bad side. It hate, pains me to say it. <laughs> pains me to say it, but they're not a bad side. The quality of, of our passing and kind of, as you said earlier, Sam, that the productivity with the ball is scarily good because I think the possession stats were about 50-50, maybe like 55 or something, but basically 50-50, but we were just so much more productive, so much more dangerous, and all of those passes were pinch, pinch perfect and quick and crisp. We're just playing such better football this season already, and there's only been one game, but my God, if that's what we're going to get this season, I'm now starting to align with you on where we might finish. Everyone always comes around eventually. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe you've come around a bit quicker this year than last year. Really quickly, before I bring any of the guys in for any more points, that the, the upgrade of Tonali, who we're going to talk about in midfield, what upgrade? Oh, come on. just the, the ability for that midfield three in particular to link up with one touch passing mm. got us through Aston Villa's press so yeah. easily, mm-hmm. so many times. Villa didn't know what to do. It was like we expected, you know, they were expecting more balls to go back to Nick Pope. More, Pope hardly had a touch yesterday, yeah. like really, mm. because, because we, don't, we don't need to go back to the goalkeeper anymore. You know, when Newcastle United are in possession in their own half, they're kind of now three passes away from being one on one and go. That that's different to last season. Yet it happened at times last season, but I just feel like already we've seen an elevation because of Tonali making other players better and allowing them to showcase that showcase their range of passing as well. That again, how do you stop it? And that's why, I, and I, we're all like kind of chomping at the bit to talk about Tonali like individually, <laughs> but it's why there were amongst fans amongst media as well some doubts as to whether he would start because actually the midfield three for Newcastle it, it's the hardest position is to play because they all have to be interchangeable and it relies so much on relationships and their ability to know and trust exactly where each other are going to be without really having to look um, and that's what's most impressive for any player of whatever caliber however much they cost to come into that you know, Bruno and Joe Linton are, are best mates. And, and like, I don't think that should be overlooked in football. Actually, if you're really good mates with someone off the pitch and you, you have this relationship, then it does build. And it's, it's very difficult to kind of break. We've all, I don't know, been to new schools or gone to universities or whatever and tried to break into pre-existing friendship groups. Like To break into that trio and be on the same level uh, is pretty impressive. This team, the, the, the characters on this team and the personalities on this team either naturally are or have been told to be the most welcoming, the most inviting kind of group ever. Every comment from Jacob Murphy, from Bruno, from Joe Linton, from all of our players was just uh, the Italian fratello, Italian word for for brother. Like it was all or or like their word for brother already. This man's only been in the squad for a month, about a month, um, maybe a little bit more. Uh, when was he? Yeah, we got him at the start of preseason, but yeah, yeah it's just five, six weeks. Yeah, f- five or six weeks, and um, and 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 that can't be that. Those relationships and that relationship build is is why we're seeing so much success on on the pitch. I think, and I don't want to go too much into individual players because, as we've said, we're going to get into them. But the the, the psychology of of hanging out, of liking each other, of okay, we've put in games rooms in the in the training ground so people hang out and, and, and get to know each other a bit more. You then know, you know when you know what your friend's going to say. In football, I guess the equivalent is you know where your friend's going to be. You know where you know how they play, you know what they're going to do, um, or you can reasonably guess. And it's already happening with this midfield. After five or six weeks, I just find that astonishing and amazing. Yeah, I think, sorry, just to, just to build on that, is that, what I mentioned before, those balls through to Barnes and Wilson later in the game. We were playing a slightly different style of football, to what we were in the first half with, with Isaac and, and Miggy. So it's like they've adapted to playing with all these different players at different times in the game with different subs off the bench and they all just seem to be absolutely in sync. So we talked last week about how well preseason has gone. It's gone fucking brilliantly because <laughs> these, these new lads don't look like they're new. They, yeah. they, they look like just part of the squad. Let's talk Sandro Tonali. We have tried so hard. The discipline on display not to go in on him from minute one in this podcast has been superb. So you have my thanks, Charlotte. No, actually, Sam, because I've not started with you on a uh-huh. question yet. Apologies. <laughs> Sam, you've got the floor. Oh, my heart sank for a second and then it jumped <laughs> again. Thank you very much. But, look, this man, it's uh, as a home, as any Premier League debut, right? We've talked about how he's come into this side. He's been there a month. He looked at home. There were doubts, as I said, about whether he would start. But actually, if you look at it logically, if you stand back, Eddie Howe's idea was to improve the team. And you don't buy a first-class ticket 
and then go and sit in the standard. And it's, it's nothing against Sean Longstaff. He was brilliant. And, the, you know, the idea last year was you can't beat Aston Villa without Sean Longstaff. Uh, but apparently you can. He, he, played, he did play. <laughs> he, did, he did come on, right? But this... <laughs> Crucial. <laughs> Crucial. <laughs> like, everything he did was just with a touch of class. And the beauty of it was, A, I loved... When he, got, when he was brought down, he got straight back up again. There was no moaning. There was no asking for bookings to be given to opposition players. It was just minimal for us. Left foot, right foot, he rotated in that midfield free. Uh, I think I'll let others have a say on him as well, because I was wowed by him. But the biggest thing was this wasn't like a, a debut hat trick for a striker where you think, OK, they've got a hat trick, but they're not going to keep that up every game. Like, yeah, with the best win in the world, a striker isn't going to have that sort of game. It's kind of the dream start. Like, that's just him. That's just how Tonali plays football. And to her being able to bring a player of that level in. And it's why what we're talking about at the start, it was logical that Newcastle United weren't going to be as good because we had this blooming good team and we've looked at the areas where we can improve and we've gone out and the recruitment team have got someone who is going to improve it, who fits in perfectly. And it's just a a massive, massive upgrade. And Longstaff had a bloody good season last year, but the idea of having Tenali in there, like, wow. Like If that's his level, if that's his base level, then we are set for a good season. I think as well, and I could, I could, you know, I like to write poetry and sing songs about players that he's won already. Wow, just so classy. Looks like he's been in this league for ages. The goal was absolutely mint to to get your foot on the ball. What a long leg to get you like to get that to get into that <laughs> position and get your foot on the ball and then like it be on target and then score is just is it's just, almost like a karate kick. Yeah, goal, yeah, it, yeah, absolutely amazing. Just to to to, to intuit in that way is indicative of how integral he's going to be to our season. But I also kind of want to talk about how I think how said after he fell in love with him about a year ago, seeing him play in Milan. And has had his eyes on him ever since. And I really love that kind of vision um, of, of, of knowing where you want us to be and knowing the players that are going to get us there. And it makes me very excited. Watching Tonali yesterday makes me very excited for the next season. And the next season, if that's the way that we're thinking about players, year, year in advance, the, okay, our midfield isn't there yet, but we're going to be there by the end of the season, then we can buy a player like that. That is massive. That, the, the foresight, the thinking, the the vision for the the team. And and getting it right as well, because Tonali, you've got it right in Tonali. He was absolutely amazing yesterday. The only other thing I can really talk about that you guys haven't already is um, in terms of that kind of popping the ball around while, when Villa were pressing, his his trust in his new teammates that he's only been playing with for, for three, four weeks and their trust in him to do those one-touch passes. And I mean, not just including the midfield, his ability to kind of use Trippier, to use Botman, to use Cher was brilliant, those, those little passes. And like, I think that's the kind of... All of those players are now bringing each other's game up. They're all good enough and they're all of, of a high enough standard that they can trust each other with those passes. There's no panic. There's no, oh, I better just play it safe here. It's like, no, I'm going to play that three-yard pass, even though he's got someone breathing down his neck because he will get it back again. It's just that kind of football was scary. And again, it's something I still, I'm still adjusting to at Newcastle United because we've never really had that that level of ability going on just like throughout the game. Yeah, there's, there's, there's two aspects to Tanali. To, to, to there's, there's number one, if you're coming into the side to replace Sean Longstaff, do you have the engine, do you have the legs, do you have the tactical discipline to get back in a position to help your teammates out? And he ticked every single one of those yeah. boxes emphatically. If he hadn't scored yesterday, if he hadn't been a kind of nine and a half out of ten performer, he would have still ticked those boxes because he's that yeah. type of player. It's the quality. It's yeah. the, I think that's what's taken a lot of fans by surprise, if not Eddie Howe, because Charlotte says he, he's been stalking the man for a year. <laughs> but... In terms of just the ability under pressure on the ball, the ability to find space, the ability to slip away from defenders, it's either the it's either the fourth goal or the chance Wilson missed from point blank range. Is the ball starts to trip here to Botman to Tonali, who's played the ball under pressure, and he just slips the, the Villa pressing player away, mm. and Newcastle are in. That that is that is quality of the highest order at, at this level, and the beautiful thing about it is. I think most fans appreciate and believe this isn't a Sissoko moment. You know, this isn't a, this is yeah. as good as it will get. It's probably a baseline. He had a good game. He can't be brilliant every week, particularly as he's still a relatively young man. But there's probably more to come from him, and that's very exciting. The difference with players like that, right? You can see it. You saw it at times last year, as good as Longstaff was. And you see it with Burn a little bit, the Burn Trippier comparison, right? 
player like Bruno isn't just thinking about the first pass he's about to make. He's thinking about the pass two or three down yeah. the line. And so you could almost visibly see at times last year, he looks and we're all going, well, Longstaff's there or Burns there. And the Bruno looks at him and goes, actually, no, I'm not going to play that pass because I'm not going to get it back straight yeah. away. And then you bring someone like Tonali in and Bruno and Joe Linton have gone, okay, yeah, so I know that if I give this pass, then three passes down the line, it's going to be there. Mm. And that's where the big upgrade is. And I, I don't like it to sound critical of Longstaff, but that's just levels. You know, people have natural talent, natural football brain. Always massive for a new player to have a big song. He's got he's got the song, doesn't he? It's already there. It's going to be really... From minute one yesterday. yeah. Um, let's move on to a player who doesn't have a song, which is a bit of a, a bit of a scandal. You know, I think as fans, we need to do a bit better. Alexander Rysak, I mean, he, do, he does have a song, but it's not, it's not as well known and sang as prominently by large numbers of people. But Isak yesterday, uh, you know, I think Johnny Greenwood of this podcast tweeted it. It ends the debate about should Isak play on the left or through the middle. In my opinion, there was never a debate, but most people, <laughs> including Eddie Howe, to be fair, Johnny, there was clearly a debate. Um, you know, Sai, thoughts on, on Isak? Yeah, there was a bit of, um, there was a lot of ABBA yesterday because uh, that is now yeah. our, our song boot comes straight out of ABBA. But he, he, did, he, did, he did get his <laughs> a, a little bit of a song going um, in the corner. Um, but yes, Isak is just, everything we said last week is exactly what we saw. This guy is a cut above anything we've ever had in terms of a centre forward, Shearer aside, um, for different reasons. But he, the things he can do in, in that third goal, which you've talked about, uh, no, one, no one else can do. He, he is probably going to be the best striker in the Premier League. Only Haaland can do better than him, potentially, oh. but he's not, Haaland's not as skillful as him. Haaland can't do things he can do. He's just, he's just, you know, he's a good centre forward and he scores lots of goals. Um, the, the, the close control, I mean, we've talked about quality and close control and touches from the rest of the team, but he's actually even better. Every touch of the ball is dangerous. Defenders are shitting themselves whenever he gets the ball. And if he gets a chance to turn around and, with, and, and get his face to goal, it's just it's just daunting for those defenders. And what I really liked about yesterday is that whilst they're worrying about where Miggy is and where Gordon is, they can't just focus on Isaac. So he finds lots of space and he was finding those little gaps and getting in. And um, I, I can't really think of enough words to, to praise the guy. But I suppose overall, in terms of, of, of all of our players, that there's no longer a way to stop Newcastle by kind of crowding out particular players. Like we talked about Maximan over the years being like, we just put two or three men on him, he's out of the game. Last season, teams were doing that to Bruno quite a bit. You know, Bruno, get a couple of men on him, get him hit hard, and then it kind of nullifies him. But if you do that, you leave space for Tonali. If you do that, you leave space on the wings. If you do that, you leave space for Isaac. And if you give Isaac time and space, he's so good, he will make something happen. He's a dangerous, dangerous player who can create chances or score goals whenever he needs to. And it's he's, he's only got two. He, he could have got a hat-trick. Like I said before, it was nice to see him come off for Wilson. And it, I was pleased that Wilson scored, but I just think that guy's going to be scoring for fun this season. Anthony Gordon, I'd like to start on. Gordon v. Barnes was the other big one. Now, Barnes has come in and got a goal and an assist. So pretty good debut for him. But I think Anthony Gordon keeps the shirt for next week. I thought that link-up first half, particularly with Isak, was, was, was pretty yeah. special. Um, Joe Linton and Gordon look like a good partnership. It gives it gives opponents so much to think about when you've got Gordon and uh, and Joe Linton both potentially running at you, both running in the box. And that first goal was the link up between those two yeah. players. The cross from Gordon on his left foot is absolutely sensational. Yes, yeah. again, it's the finish that will get the the praise. I actually thought a Villa defender would flick the ball on into Tonali's path, but I've watched the replay a lot, and it's not. It's just it's just it's an absolute cross. brilliant cross with his wrong foot and. I kind of feel that this Newcastle side, particularly in the front three areas, is all going to be about contributions this season. Like you need to contribute in an, in like a goals or assist manner, or at least some sort of involvement in goals, mm-hmm. to keep your place because the competition is so, is so high for players that want to play ahead of you that you have to do it. And to get that yesterday from Gordon, I, th- I thought was tremendous. I thought he tired a little bit as the game went on, and that's why he came off pretty early. But if he can, if if at least for the first few weeks of the season, if it keeps going as well as it has. If he can give us 55, 60 minutes at that level and then Barnes come on and either reach that level or, or potentially add even more, you know, I don't, you don't want to get too hyperbolic, but I suppose why not? You know, it, it's one of those positions, again, when Newcastle United are, are as well stocked as anyone in the Premier League in terms of having more than one player for the first team that can do that. So absolutely buzzing for Anthony Gordon. I also think his fitness is just going to in- increase. It's just going to get better. We're... Eddie Howe and, and Jason Tindall, my dog, will have noticed that he oh he looks a little bit tired out. He his pace is ridiculous. No wonder he's tired out. But that's something they're just going to work on. It's just it's just going to get better. That was the first game of the season. 
he said, didn't he, after his home debut, he came off at half time and he said, I didn't feel like I was playing badly. I just didn't know how to play in this Newcastle United team and this Newcastle United system. And there, there's the beauty, it's similar with Jacob Murphy. There's a player who's listened, a player, a young player, highly talented. There was talk elsewhere of him being a bit of a kind of rogue at Everton, but he's come in and he has watched and he's realised he's not in the side. He's realised what he's got to do to get into the side. He's gone away to the Euros, one player of the tournament. Um, like It was just that integration period for him for three or four months. And I think we're starting to see the best of Gordon. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point we might see Barnes on the left and Gordon on the right. I mean, that's a debate for the future. But he's another one of these like, players who can play in multiple positions are brilliant assets and players that can do it with the quality Gordon has. Uh, like, I, I'm delighted we've got him. Put poor Matty Cash. What what a day for him! Like he missed that great great chance, obviously, but he spent sixty minutes running, r- chasing shadows with Gordon, and said, like, "All right, finally he's going off." Ah, oh, Harvey Barnes. He's even quick, and I couldn't believe how much space he was given Barnes. But I think Cash just couldn't. They can't couldn't keep do up. Anything. Yeah, because ba- ba- Barnes was in like ten yards of space every mm-hmm. time, and we found the pass. But teams are going to have to stop doing that because he will get the twenty goals. I said I sat here last week and said he's going to get, even if he's only playing thirty minutes. Because, uh, my God. It was 22 minutes yesterday and one goal and one assist. Like, that's an excellent return. Yeah. If we can if we can get that out of him every week on a bigger scale. Could have been, could have been yeah, could have more as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you set that one up insane, for Wilson. Really, the, the, if you add the Real game, which no one will, which is fair enough because it's a friendly, but in terms of his you know contributions per minute, it's looking pretty crazy for Harvey Barnes. And it goes to Sai's point from earlier on, actually extended games are going to help us because we've got yeah. Barnes and Wilson coming on. And yeah. you've also got Murphy, like Longstaff Anderson. They're about the fittest blokes in the squad. Like, yeah. So give them 110 minutes. Like Give them those last 30, 40 minutes yeah. of defenders. Like That's only going to benefit us. Five subs, longer games, things that would have fucking killed us. <laughs> <over line. laughs> would have just, would have been gone, would have been done. League one. So many excuses for Bruce there. <laughs> We'll talk, we've probably got time to talk one more player. Who wants to go? Who wants to just take the floor? Sven Botman. Yeah, he's on your T-shirt. I was going to say. Yeah, yeah we got to yeah. talk about Sven Botman. He was excellent yesterday. And we were, Alex and I were talking in the car um, here. And there was that moment where he sort of fell, fell backwards. And, and I think a lot, we, we were talking about this. I think a lot of people will point to that and be like, well, that was terrible. And then uh, open the goal and, and blah, blah, blah. And it's just because they, they missed and were a bit shit that that, that didn't go to 3-2. But he was so good yesterday. He was so good. He was all over the pitch. He, I, 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 he's such an understated player. Like Tenali's your standout. Gordon had another had an excellent game. Those are the, the sort of attacking players are the ones you kind of talk about because we are going forward. We're, we're we're pushing on for goals and we scored five of them. But we don't score five goals and they only score one without Botman's shift at the back. It was it was just clearing. He's just this physical presence that they couldn't deal with, and I just wanted to shout him out. Love him. Yeah. Other than that goal, which was pretty poor, it's like uh, yeah, the, the new bad. lad who's actually playing really well. He, he looked pretty. Uh, Diaby was was good, and you can see why they've signed him. But let's just leave him in like five yards of space, and <laughs> it was a very good volley. Obviously, you know, nine times out of ten he might smash that over the bar. But uh, other than that, I thought the entire back four was, yeah. was really solid, and yeah, Botman probably exemplified that more than most, and it's the. It's the interceptions and things that he does that are just, he makes them look so routine. He doesn't just intercept the ball and kind of kick it out of play like like a Lascelles would probably get to the ball and just kick it out, which is good. It's decent defending, but Botman intercepts the ball, gets it under control and finds a pass. And we, we retain so much possession from these situations that it just mean it gives opposition teams no respite. So they're trying to break. We nick the ball back and then they're defending again because we don't just nick the ball back, nick the ball back and immediately recycle it into an attacking threat. And it's, Botman is so good at that. And it's the it's what we were saying before, isn't it? It's not passing back to Nick Pope, and Nick Pope yeah. has got nothing to do. He's just Botman identifies where the ball needs to go, gets it, and puts it there. It's just so good. Yeah. I was going to ask you all if this was a shock. Is this an upset? Not an upset in terms of Newcastle winning the game, but has it shocked us? Has it shocked the football world? Do, do, do the avalanche of pundits predicting seventh and below for Newcastle now immediately regret it? Do any of you regret your, your preseason predictions, or actually is this just business as usual? There are lots and lots of centre forwards in the past 18 months who've come to St James's Park and look pretty average. There are lots of teams that have come to St James's Park and look pretty average in the not. And if you think of two of Newcastle's last three home games have been against Brighton, who are a good side, and against Villa, who are a good side, and both were lucky to lose by what they did. Yeah. Right. That that's that's pretty good. That you know, Arsenal aren't doing that to, to top teams. Liverpool aren't doing that to top teams anymore. 
or Manchester City doing it? Well, we'll see. Probably they're, they're, they're the one side. But it almost feels like St. James's Park is the hardest place to go, not just because Newcastle's overall very good record there last season, but in terms of just watching the football yesterday, you know, you're right, Diaby had a good game, Sai. No one else did. And Newcastle won every single individual battle across that pitch. Emery's making changes at half time. Emery's making changes, mm. having to make changes to try and shift the narrative of the game. And he just can't. He's a good manager and he can't do it. He, he, he is unable. And Bartman is a crucial part of that. And I thought he was brilliant yesterday. And I think his, like you just said, his ability to find a, a teammate in space. But he also trusts his teammates. Yeah. He trusts his midfielders under pressure. Uh, and that's quite important as well because it's, Newcastle very rarely go long. Like we can and do sometimes occasionally under how we don't need to at the minute because we're able to play through teams with such ease. And that probably starts with Bartman, Shaw and Trippier at least. But let's talk about this question to end the shot then. You know, has this, is this, is this shocked the football world? Is it, is it shocked you guys? What do you think? I'm not shocked. I don't think, I don't think shock is the right word. I thought we'd win. I was sort of qu- quietly confident that we'd win, but not, but so emphatically, not by so many goals, not by such an easy performance against what is a good side. Um, in terms of the football world, pundits and stuff, yeah, I think they probably are sitting up a little bit. Like, they'll probably reserve their judgments and, and try and preserve their um, egos a little bit by saying, well, it's one game, it's, over, it's the first game of the season, so it's St. James's Park, I've got Man City next week. Um, but I think people are going to quite quickly revise how they how they see Newcastle finishing this season because if that was the beginning of our season, there's so much more to come. I think a lot of people, uh, pundits wise, expected Villa to come and get something. Actually, there's a lot of talk about Aston Villa, and they were blown away. Like, I was shocked. I, like, I thought we'd win. I did think we'd win uh, because we are a very very good side. I didn't think we'd win five one, uh, and we wouldn't always win that guy, game five one. I don't think, but. There was all this talk uh, that whatever the algorithm is about how Newcastle's start is so hard, like the hardest in the league. But actually, get those games. It's the perfect time to have them when there's no midweek competitions. There's just one game every Saturday. Have those games now. Like, it's not logical that we won't be as good as last season. I, I think we'd, I said at the start of the season, well, there was only a week ago that I thought we'd finish fourth. And that, obviously, yesterday hasn't done anything to change that. You look at the other teams, like, we're, all we're doing is upgrading an existing system other sides like chelsea, like chelsea will probably be pretty good in, in two or three years time but you to make wholesale changes liverpool have got a whole new midfield like they, they are having to make ma- this major surgery whereas we're just bringing in just little upgrades like I, uh, not not shocked but a little bit surprised at the result uh, delighted obviously yeah i think um I, I i don't mind pundits under underestimating us it's, it's a good thing to go under the radar and just just go about our business I think that's how Howard would prefer it rather than everyone talking us up and having to kind of justify that but yeah I think we've definitely shocked the world I was I was shocked I think it's fair to say I was shocked now not because I didn't think we'd win the game like you Sam I, I, I'm sure I was saying 3-0 in the pub before the game which would have been just as good a result obviously but um, I was surprised by how good we are in the first game of the season and that's probably down to the fixture list that we knew about I think Eddie Howe knew he had to prepare for these fixtures a bit more thoroughly he, knew, he knows what's coming in September in terms of the fixture crunch with the Premier League, uh, Champions League. So it's very important that we actually did get points on the board and got, got our season going early. I always refer back to last year when we were, I thought it took us a while to get going and we talk about momentum and we talk about um, the confidence building over those first six or seven games. And then we really hit our stride towards the end of September and into October, November before the World Cup disrupted that. And then we had to kind of start from scratch again. Whereas we've started like, we, like we're in the middle of that run um, this year when that's probably down to good preparation, good preseason, um, lots of confidence in the camp. But I'm just, I was blown away by how good we were so quickly because like I say, I've, I've got used to us taking a bit of time to, to work out kind of our best formula, work out how to break teams down. Um, and like you said, Sam Villa was supposed to be good and they came here expecting to give us a game and like how how dominant we were is, is scary. And I, I'll admit to being shocked by the performance. As fans, I think a lot of us write off pre-season. Like we, we're sitting here talking about this being the first game of the season. For Eddie Howe and Jason Tindall, it isn't. It's the eighth or ninth mm. game of the season. Like the first game of the season was Gateshead. And actually, they are... Whereas in the past, people like Bruce, or the, like pre-season, have just been like, well, who hasn't played this week, right? He needs 45, yeah. he needs 60. Like They have been meticulous in their planning. And there's yeah. a plan building towards this. So this is it wouldn't have shocked them. That's the thing about it. It's not their first game of the season. They're, they've had a month 
eight or nine games in, we just as supporters are so conditioned to pre-season just being a bit of a write-off, just a bit of a oh, try and get 90 minutes into a few of the lads' legs, but it's not like that anymore. I think we've shocked a lot of the football world. I think I think a lot of the stuff has, has probably been disrespectful, really, towards Newcastle, particularly from, uh, you know, Carragher, Neville. Does it matter? No. People forget about these things pretty quickly once the season actually starts. But one of the reasons we've talked about it so much in this podcast is, you know, why would we get worse? There's the Champions League to consider. There will be more games. There's, there's lots could go wrong, but there's also a hell of a lot could go right for this Newcastle side. And I think what we saw yesterday, like you said earlier, Sam, this wasn't the perfect game from Newcastle. This wasn't mm. like everything was amazing. This wasn't the game of their lives. This was just Newcastle United operating somewhere near the top of their capability. There's work to do still, as Howe said after the game. Um, and I just think Newcastle are better than Aston Villa, particularly at home. They're just better than them. And that puts us in, you know, in a tremendous position. On top of that, you have St. James's Park factor, which again yesterday was just at the top. St. James's was at the top of its game yesterday as well in terms of a fan base. And it's just very, very hard to stop that. And that's one of the great things about this season. And this is one of the great things about next week is we immediately go into a fixture against Manchester City where once again we'll be able to test ourselves and, re- and, and, and kind of talk about how good we both are and could be as the season progresses. And it's pro- it's a good time to play Man City, like Sam said. It's also a good time to play them because they play a cup final this week and we don't. We have a full week to prepare. Man City have a big squad. They're used to this kind of thing. I'm sure they'll be okay because of it. But I, like, I'm going to the game. I can't wait. Just get me now to Saturday night <laughs> to the ludicrous kickoff time of 8 p.m. Yeah. Uh, to accommodate this uh, this cup final that they've got. Uh, so there, we'll finish the show there. Thanks to you. Sai, Sam and Charlotte, thanks to everybody for listening and watching on YouTube if that's how you decided to do this this week. Uh, We'll be back after Manchester City. Speak to you then. Bye-bye.